hi everybody uh, welcome to my ethics zoom presentation and i would like to introduce to you today the idea of eastern ethics so we just finished a lesson plan on western ethics and in that lesson plan we started with the greco-roman philosophers going all the way back to socrates the greek philosophers and then there's through some roman philosophers and all the way up into modern times so there was a lot to cover there with the western uh eastern i'm sorry with the western um, ethical thinkers, but now we want to look at some Eastern uh, ethics as well to have what's called kind of a well-balanced or multicultural approach to the subject. So first I want to open up the share screen and go to the lesson plan. And here we go. We open up the course here and then I'm going to go to the modules. I'm sure you guys have done this many times now. And you're going to go to lesson plan four and it's on Eastern ethics. Now, when I say Eastern ethics, I'm not talking about a particular Eastern ethical teacher. I'm talking more about uh, Eastern religions. And yes, there are Eastern teachers here, like the Buddha, like the founder of Jainism, Mahavira, like uh, Taoism and Confucianism. We have Lao Tzu and Confucius. So yes, there are teachers involved, but it's different than the Western lesson plan where I had very specifically, let's learn what Nietzsche said, and let's learn what Kant said, and let's learn what Hume said. This is more generalistic about overall Hindus approach in dealing with ethics and Buddhist approach when dealing with ethics, just so you guys get a glimpse. If you find this interesting, um, I highly, highly, highly recommend you take uh, World Religions. I teach World Religions, which is Philosophy 15, and we spend lesson plans on each of these and go really in depth learning about each of these different Eastern religions. So this is just again a glimpse. Um, if you go down to the required reading, it's not overwhelming. It's an article here on the history of Eastern ethics. This is a shorter lesson plan. And then I have one on the Jain readings. The Jain readings, um, I, I did a sabbatical a couple years ago where I studied Jainism for, for Mount Sac. Um, they give me a sabbatical every, every eight years you're allowed to have one. And I chose Jainism for one of my semesters where I just, for the whole semester, read everything I could get my hands on in Jainism, read the scriptures, studied all the academic material. And then out of that, I produced two books and three films. The three films are assigned in the uh, films for this lesson plan. And in terms of the books, I didn't assign you um, one of them, just <clears throat> a small section of another one. So I didn't assign you both. But this one here, I think it's just on pages one through 16. This is a very famous Jane symbol, which is the hand, and, and it's a wheel representing the wheel of birth and death, and that we can get out of the wheel of birth and death if we practice ahimsa. And this is ahimsa written in a different language. So ahimsa is the principle of compassion and nonviolence. So it's through compassion and through moral living that one can be spiritually liberated. So Jainism is a beautiful philosophy, and I highlighted a little bit more in this lesson plan than the other religions because it really captures the whole essence of morality. And so uh, where am I heading with this? I'm trying to get to the concept here. So here it starts here. And then what page are we starting? What page is that? So that's page one. So here we have uh, Jainism and I introduce you to um, <clears throat> Jainism by kind of giving you uh, an annotated bibliography of uh, the ser several books. And this one was by Jeffrey Long and I kind of walk you through it. It really brings um, to bear kind of what Jainism is about by uh, learning about what that scholar has to say. And I think the next one is going to be this book here and it's Jainism and Ecology. So I consciously chose uh, material for you for this lesson plan on the Jains that really touches on ethics specifically, not all of Jainism, but focuses on ethics and um, how they are one of the first environmental movements that have ever existed on this planet and so forth. So that is your reading assignment there. And let's start at the top here. So Hinduism. So Hinduism is impossible to cover in five minutes. So I'm not even gonna tackle that, but just to let you know that how it relates to ethics, they have this concept. I'm just gonna focus on a few key ideas of each of these religions. They have this concept that there's four goals of life and the overall ultimate goal is to be spiritually liberated, to be enlightened. Um, the word for that is moksha and moksha translates as spiritual liberation. They have this philosophy and it's inherent in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, or Jainism, you can pronounce it either way. They have this concept that we're stuck in this wheel of birth and death and that whole reincarnation concept, but it's not necessarily a positive uh, situation because there's so much pain and so much suffering and so much tragedy as we live our lives and we are experiencing that right now with all 
uh, you know, the pandemic-ish stuff that's going on. And so the ultimate goal is to get out of that wheel of birth and death, that wheel of pain and suffering. And how do you do that? You become spiritually liberated. And that's the ultimate goal is moksha. But there are three other goals they talk about. And one is the goal of, you know, material pursuits. They, they don't necessarily say you can't have a family and have a job and have a career. Okay, that's one here. Another, I'll, I'll avoid the Indian terms at this moment. Um, once in a while, I'll sprinkle them in. They say it's okay to have the goal or the desire for um, the aesthetic or the beautiful or the romantic love, and that's comma. And then they also talk about one of the goals of life is to have duty, to have moral obligation. And that Indian word is something I will mention here, and that's dharma. Dharma refers to moral duty or uh, obligation. And so that is one of the necessary requirements um, of life. So having moral duty, having a family and a career is fine to have, having love and the romance is fine to have, but don't forget about this. These three deal with the world. All of them uh, can help you lead to moksha. So moksha is one of the goals. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a family and a job and you have to have romance in order to attain moksha. It's just saying it's okay if you do. And if you want to skip all of those, um, for sure, moral duty and moksha would be the key then for spirituality. So the other two are just saying you can live in the world, but don't forget about the spiritual stuff as well. So to attain moksha, an ethical life is required, and that's what's mentioned there. Now, moving along, um, we're going to talk about Buddhism. I'm not going to give you all of the history. It's just way too much to cover. It's not a world religions class, but Buddhism is, uh, in terms of size, it's, it's half the size of Hinduism in the world. Hinduism's about one billion, and Buddhists are about a half a billion in terms of numbers. Um, the Buddhist tradition goes back 2,500 years ago in India, where Hinduism goes back about four to 5,000 years. But Buddhism, we're going to talk about to understand their position when it relates to ethics, is Buddha had this understanding that there's eight steps to becoming enlightened. It's called the Eightfold Path. Uh, the last step is enlightenment itself. And those steps that one take, a lot of those steps deal with morality. So in order to become enlightened, one must be moral. It's kind of a very similar thing we're talking about here. Uh, Dharma helps lead to moksha. It can contribute to that. So Buddhism had this on concept that um, these eight steps, and here I have them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these eight steps, it could kind of be broken into three subdivisions. So the first two steps deal with right views, understanding um, what's in Buddhism is called the Four Noble Truths, that life is filled with suffering, suffering is caused by our desires, we can stop suffering by stopping our clinging and our desires, and how do we do that? We follow the Eightfold Path. That's the Four Noble Truths. And now it leads us to the Eightfold Path, which is really what I'm going to focus on. So having the right views and intentions, and this section here, these three steps of the Eightfold Path within Buddhism is having right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And right speech is not speaking ill of people, not gossiping, not slandering, um, not hurting with your words. Right action is an action out of compassion. Always um, realize that your actions have consequences. Always to pursue a life of ahimsa or nonviolence in all your actions. Right livelihood is whatever career you choose. Make sure it's grounded in ahimsa. Again, a word that means compassion or nonviolence. So these three deal with morality. And the next three steps of the Eightfold Path deal with meditation and um, achieving what is, is referred to as enlightenment. Um, in, you can use that in a similar way of, of con, kind of the Hindu concept of moksha. I mean, there are differences, but you can kind of understand it that way. Enlightenment is waking up to one's higher self and you, when one does, is now liberated from the wheel of birth and death. Buddhism has that same kind of concept there. So um, moving down here, oh, before you get out of Buddhism, there is one more element that relates to this class is Buddha taught a life of moderation, a life that's called the middle path um, and where one doesn't go to the extremes of overindulgence or asceticism. And that's very important because we run across that with Aristotle. We run across that also with Confucian thought. So it's both in the East and in the West. So that middle path concept is very important there. Now we're going to move to Jainism. Now Jainism is one of the Eastern traditions that I pay a little more attention to in this lesson plan. It's probably one you're not exposed to in 
uh, prior to this class. A lot of students have never heard of it and they're like uh, amazed by it. I just did a Zoom lecture for my World Religions class on Jainism for 30 minutes. So I did a lot of Jain talk today. But to understand Jainism, how it relates to this class is two principles. One is Ahimsa, both start with the letter A, and one is Anikantavada, and I'll explain both of those. Ahimsa is simply translates as nonviolence or compassion. They believe that it's a necessary ingredient to become spiritually enlightened, to be awakened, to be uh, spiritually evolved and attain moksha. And what that entails is not killing, not um, not causing harm to another. I have these other uh, attributes that they also follow, but let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about Ahimsa for a second. So it impacts their job. It impacts, um, you know, how what they eat. It impacts where they walk. And how can Ahimsa impact all of that? Because if they're taking that vow of not causing harm to others, it's not just humans, it's others. Anything that has the ability to experience pain, anything that has consciousness, uh, if something can run away from you, certainly it doesn't want to be hurt. So it's that whole concept of there's the insect world. They run and hide in little corners when they're being, you know, when you're coming out with them with that, you know, that cloth to grab and kill them. So they're certainly protective. And Jane's very much take um, compassion on the insect world and vow not to harm them. Jane's take uh, compassion on the animal world and vow not to eat animals. So they're very, very strict vegetarians, not vegans. Um, veganism is a more modern concept, and um, for Jainism, it's been around 2,500 years, as old as Buddhism, if not older a little bit. Uh, the Jains have this idea that the animal um, should not be eaten, uh, should not be killed. It's not necessary. A lot of people, you know, say, oh, you need it to survive, and the Jains would say, certainly you don't, because this religion for 2,500 years has been not eating meat and surviving quite healthily. Um, a, all of the Jain world, all of the Jain practitioners are vegetarian. Some Buddhists are, some Hindus are, but all the Jains. So the vow of not killing is taken very seriously at the, at the animal level, at the insect level, at the human level, etc. It impacts what kind of career they'll choose because they'll make sure they do one based on ahimsa, a job that uh, it doesn't entail, you know, hurting life of any way, shape, or form. And that would also cause them to avoid the military because they don't want to be in a position where they have to kill. Um, they wouldn't want to work in factories that dealt with, you know, killing of, of animals. They wouldn't deal um, with jobs that killed, you know, those uh, companies that come to your home and kill the pests and so forth. So they very consciously choose jobs that dealt with um, compassion and not killing of any sort. And um, they also take other vows. Um, they have five vows that they take. One is ahimsa. One is never to steal. And one is to always speak honestly. And so, and one is to kind of move away from worldly desire. So I have, there's actually five vows, but here's four of them. So not to kill or ahimsa, not to steal, always uh, focus on what is the honest thing to do. And in terms of, of language, always make sure you're careful in your words and you're not hurting with your words and so forth, desiring worldly things, they shy away from that and say, let's put attention on what's important and for them that spirituality and not things of this world. So they take a vow of non-attachment to the things of this world. And um, so moving along to our next principle of the Jains, it's Anikantavada. And it is a very important principle. I think it fits nicely in this class because Anikantavada simply translates as multiple perspective or not one-sided. And it's the idea that there's always kind of a different angle we could take on a subject. And so sometimes we become so dogmatic and so myopic and think that we have the commodity on truth. And the Jains say a real healthy and a real more intelligent approach is to have more of an Anikantavada approach. And there's a Jain analogy to highlight that. It's a story that's told, uh, we might've heard of it before. And I replay it in one of the films that you'll watch for the class where there is uh, these blind men, um, kind of, it's like, again, an analogy here that they go off and they experience an elephant, but they're blind, so they can only feel part of the elephant, and they come back and tell the king what the elephant is like, and one describes the elephant as a big round rock, because he felt the body, or a long snake, because he felt the tail or the trunk, or a big tree, because he felt the leg, you know, a tree trunk, and so each gave a different depiction of what the elephant is about, and each were kind of right in their, in their description, but each were um, able to learn from the other. And so that idea that everybody kind of has these different takes on things and it's kind of a healthy thing to 
realize that a multiple perspective is a better perspective than just a one-sided perspective. I just noticed I misspelled ahimsa there, I'll add the S, so that was a mistake. But anikantavada is a very important principle, um, and it fits for ethics because it's really asking us to step outside of our comfort zone and understand and appreciate what other people have to say, and it builds for ahimsa and our human relationships, okay? So here we have another Eastern philosophy, and this is no longer from India, these three are from India. Um, this one here is from China, and it's two, Taoism and Confucianism. And they both have kind of a very similar message in a way, but they apply to different parts of our lives. Taoism feels is more about our relationship with nature, and Confucianism is more about our relationship with society and other humans. Um, they're both kind of principles are advocating, I'm sorry, teachings that advocate living a simple life, um, living a life where you're not uh, focused on materialism, living a life where you're trying to cultivate compassion, living a life where you're not petty, um, not being vain and egoistic and pursuing things of the world. So there's very common themes in these two Chinese philosophies. As a matter of fact, it's argued that you could be both a Taoist and a Confucian and a Buddhist at the same time in those three philosophies fit beautiful to get beautifully together. A Taoist um, approaches, touches upon your connection with nature, Confucianism with society, and then Buddhism with the metaphysical. So they all three can blend nicely together. You could be all three philosophy slash religions at the same time and not necessarily be a contradiction. So in Confucius thought, they talk about the superior man or the Chengzu, and the superior man is one of love, um, one of compassion, and how do we cultivate that? And Confucian taught that we can cultivate it through right actions um, and propriety and everybody kind of having a certain level of respect. And there's a great sense of respect in Confucian thought for the elderly, um, which is something I think is kind of lacking in our modern day times here in the West. Um, but also not returning evil for evil uh, is, is a concept here. And evil is not inherent in humans, but it's from a bad environment. And if we can change that environment, we can prosper and so forth. So Confucian and Taoist thought, Jain thought, Buddhist thought, and Hindu thought all fit under the category of Eastern ethics. And I think they all offer us kind of kernels of um, truth, so to speak, and interesting insights about how to um, kind of live a, a life of eudaimonia, a life where we can live well and flourish. So that's, again, the theme of the class, sort of eudaimonia or living well. And required reading I talked about. Uh, required films, it kind of looks like there's a lot of film watching, but they're all very short. And I wanted to give you a glimpse of each of these. So that's why. So let's start down here. We have Hinduism for five minutes and Buddhism for five minutes. We have a couple films on the uh, Chinese thought. Uh, Wu Wei is the action of inaction. And I think that's just a neat little short film, Taoism, Confucianism. And then I have a mini lecture that I gave on Chinese religions for my world religion students. It's only four minutes, but it really captures all of this. These are three Jain films I did for my sabbatical, Anikantavada, Ahimsa, and The Life of Mahavira. Mahavira is recognized as the founder of the Jain philosophy. Um, and here is uh, Jain Ethics. It's a six minute film about Jainism, introduction to Jainism. So it, it's a little heavy on the Jains, um, but at the same time, I think that they really set a, up a beautiful model for understanding Eastern ethics. Okay, and then your post question. So your post question, again, concentrates on Jainism. Click out of that. Um, so it's really understanding the Jain's ethical message. T try if, as your best you can to pull ideas from the readings in the film to make a strong post there when you articulate Jain ethics and then uh, application to your life. Um, so it's always nice not to just explain stuff, but to apply it to you and make it more of a personal connection with that philosophy. Okay, this was a little bit short, um, shorter of a Zoom presentation, but maybe you like that. So uh, Eastern Ethics is a shorter lesson plan. Altogether, I think it's, what do I have here? Film watching, post and all that. It's like almost about a two hour lesson plan. So it's not the classic three hours that some of them are. Okay, clicking out of that. And then um, we will head after this to two science topics, and that will be for next week, the origins, or for our next uh, lesson plans, the origins of ethics, we'll be looking at evolutionary ethics, and then neuroethics, we'll be looking at brain research. So these are going to be much more grounded in science, 
And the, this right here, it seems to be a lot of um, Eastern religion. We'll pull up into religion one more time when we get to lesson plan 11 and 12. We cover religion and ethics and where we cover a lot of the East and the Western different views on topics like capital, um, I'm sorry, like abortion. Um, what else did I want to say? Euthanasia, animal rights, stem cell research. So what the different religions say there. And then we'll have our final lesson plan on the topic of can you be moral even without religion? And um, I'm certainly going to argue yes. I'm curious what you guys have to say because a lot of people I know are non-religious and quite moral people. So that there's kind of a, a few various articles to read on that one. Okay, thank you for watching. I'm going to stop share and uh, conclude this short Zoom presentation. I'm not even sure how long it was, but I think it was less than 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Namaste. Have a nice one. Bye-bye.